We are back on the Rational Boomer Podcast. Hopefully your day is going well. It is Friday. Tomorrow, Ed will be back. He missed last week. He'll be back tomorrow. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, the next day, it looks like Arlene is going to be with us. You know, she's that uh, political science professor who knows so much. I love having her on the show because she knows a lot about the details and the facts I talk big picture, but she knows the facts, and that will be an interesting show. So that's coming up. This weekend will be good with Ed and Arlene. I wanted to mention something, too. I had something happened uh, yesterday that uh, a lot of people would think I'd be mad about, and I'm not happy about it, but I'm not really worried about it either. I got notified in the morning that um, Facebook had suspended my account. And when they suspend your account, they also suspend Instagram. Now, I post on TikTok and YouTube. Those are the two mainstays. Those are the ones I really focus on. But I also posted those same TikToks on Facebook and then ultimately Instagram. So there's nothing different on Facebook than there is on TikTok or YouTube. Nonetheless, I was told that I was suspended. We don't know how long. I don't know if it's indefinitely or it's a period of time. I did have the opportunity to appeal it. I um, It took me four tries to get it done because I don't know what's going on with Facebook. But I did appeal it, and we'll see what happens. Now, the thing about it is, is I'm not that big a fan of Facebook. I started out my um, social media career, as it were, on Facebook. But I've grown tired of it. Instagram is okay. I like it. Um, I'm not worried about the fact that they are suspending me. I'd be curious as to know why TikTok hasn't suspended me. YouTube hasn't suspended me, but fa Facebook clearly has. Now, I think one of the things you have to understand about suspensions and things like this happening, there isn't some social media God listening to everything you say. And then when you step out of line, they suspend you. That's not how it works. The way it works is uh, you get some people grouping together, making the complaints, then Facebook takes you down, and then it's up to you to defend yourself and get you back up. That's pretty much the way it goes. So basically what must have happened is some uh, Trump fox got butthurt about something I said, and they got together and they made the complaint to Facebook, and Facebook suspended me. So that's where I'm at at this point. Fact of the matter is, is if you want to hear what what's going on. You don't have to go to Facebook or Instagram. You can get it on TikTok, of course, or you can go to YouTube. That's kind of my new favorite right now because it's so simple. You can go to uh, YouTube and get all the TikToks that I do on TikTok and Facebook, and you can get the Rational Boomer podcast, this very show, on YouTube. So you got it all packed together in one spot. Uh, I'll keep you posted as to how things go with uh, Facebook I mean, I like to get back on there, but I, I'm not really concerned about it. I haven't done anything to monetize on Facebook or or Instagram. I'm, you know, I make a little money from TikTok and a little money from YouTube, and that's plenty. I don't, I don't need to uh, monetize everything I fucking do, uh, and it's just more of a headache than anything else uh, with Facebook and Instagram. So I am suspended, and I'm so hurt. I'm so weepy. <laughs> now, nah, we'll, we'll get by. We'll get by fine. As long as TikTok and YouTube are going strong, that's all I really care about. I suspect they'll put me back up on Facebook at some time soon, and then I'll keep posting there as long as they allow me to do it. All right. We had the big interview last night. Tim Walls and Kamala Harris were going to be interviewed by Dana Bash on CNN. Now, a lot of Republicans were saying, well, she's afraid to do an interview. She's too stupid to do an interview. She doesn't want to do an interview. Well, that's just not the case. Fact of the matter is Kamala's been a little busy as of late, you know, having campaign rallies, pulling in tens of thousands of people, having a very successful convention, and, of course, kicking Donald Trump's ass. You don't really have time to sit down and just talk some bullshit. Well, she did it last night with Tim Walls, and uh, 
you know, it was really overhyped. Oh, this is the big interview. I knew it wasn't going to be a big deal because it's not like Kamala Harris has never done an interview before and she handles them just fine. And the one last night she handled just fine. It wasn't over the top explosive, but it wasn't bad for her either. It was fine. And that's all it was, was an interview. I, I didn't watch the whole interview. I saw bits and pieces. I know Dana kind of tried to, um, uh, uh, sucker her into some things, which Kamala didn't allow her to do. You got to remember on CNN and Dana Bash, they have a history with uh, with Joe Biden and Donald Trump. You remember that infamous debate was on CNN and the moderators were Dana Bash and Jake Tapper. You know, the fucks that didn't uh, push back, didn't fact check, just let Donald Trump run rogue. Yeah, the same people. So I wasn't expecting this was going to be exactly a friendly situation. And it wasn't terrible. Dana Bash was just kind of boring and dull. And she tried a couple times, but it was all for naught. Uh, Kamala did just fine. And I've got some emails of people responding to that interview that will start things off with the emails. First one comes from Michael T. of Wilmington, Delaware. He said, hi, Mike, this is Mike from Delaware. As far as the interview goes, I think it was way overhyped and advertised way too heavily as if Kamala hates the media and is eluding them. I'm not too impressed with the interview. A lot of fluff. Dana Bash is better than that. No, she's not. She was too handcuffed by CNN bigwigs and asked a lot of easy questions. Dana ignored the elephant in the room, Donald Trump. Anyway, Kamala and Tim both handled their business despite the softball questions. What are your thoughts? Again, I only saw bits and pieces of it. I, I, I'm not an expert on it. I'll try to watch it. I knew it was going to be kind of boring because I knew Kamala wasn't going to allow them to make this explosive. She doesn't need to. She just needs to answer the questions uh, directly and consistently and then move on to the um, rallies and such. Um, I don't know that Dana was being pressured by the bigwigs at CNN to take it easy on Kamala. They are more pointing toward the other side. I would think they would have gone after Kamala, given the history of uh, the infamous debate and the fact that the CEO of the company is a diehard Trump humper who uh, donates to Donald Trump's campaign. This is why we've all kind of questioned CNN as of late as to whether they are truly fair and balanced and if they are um, middle of the road or even left leaning. I think they're headed more toward Fox News. I don't listen to CNN typically. All right, the next one comes from Will. He's a regular guest on the program. He says, Mike, it was a basic interview. Bash tried to create chaos, but they look good. The CNN pundits were arrogant a-holes. Talk to you soon, Will, and leave it to Will to break it down to simple terms. And I appreciate that, Will. I know Will watched it. That's part of the reason. I had some other things going today my wife had me involved in. I was going to watch it. I only watched bits and pieces, uh, but I didn't expect it was going to be a big deal. And I knew we had plenty of motherfuckers out in this audience that will have watched every second and, uh, Report to us here on the Rational Boomer podcast. All right. The next one comes from Old Soul. She says, I just saw on CNN a host speaking down on VP Harris because she's doing a sit down interview with Governor Walls. The blatant racism and sexism is rampant. It's beyond frustrating. I should probably feel upset, but in my mind, I know this is the reason Republicans are going to lose the suburban women vote. They imply women are weak and can't make tough decisions. They use that lie to justify their opinion as why women can't be in positions of power. I choose to watch this disingenuous spectacle with a smile because it is the equivalent to watching them dig their own grave. In case anyone listening doesn't know how normal sit-down interviews with presidential running mates are, here's a list with pictures, you can't see the pictures, starting in 2008. Thanks for all you do. 2008, interview with McCain and Palin. 2008, an interview with Obama and Biden. 2012, Romney and Ryan. 
2016, Clinton and Kane. 2016, Trump and Pence. 2020, Biden and Harris. 2024, Trump and Vance. That little prick, Jesse Waters, did the sit-down with Trump and Vance a month ago. Old soul. I always talk about how Will's all fired up. But as of late, Old Soul's been kind of fired up, too. She's a sweet, unassuming lady. But she's not the one you want to get pissed off. She's very emotional, and she hates injustice. And the idea that these people are trying to hold Kamala Harris's feet over the coals because she brought Tim Walls on the interview, she makes a very good point that this is pretty much standard fare. This happens all the time, so shut the fuck up. Thank you, old soul. I appreciate it. All right. Next one says, it's from Greg. Hello. First off, I love your show. You tell it like it is. I live in Texas. The state is where voter suppression is happening every day and racism is running rampant. Hoping voters can turn this state blue. Sincerely, Greg. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people have been talking about Texas turning blue. I'd always talk to Jace, who is a regular guest on the program and is from Texas. He wasn't so sure that that was going to be the case based on his experience and history with Texas. But as of late, he's starting to see some more things, and he's kind of leaning toward the prospect of Texas turning blue. And what I have to tell you is if Texas and Florida turns blue, turn out the lights because the party's over for Donald Trump. If the three um, uh, steel belts, the Wisconsin, Michigan, and Ohio flip to blue. It's over for Donald Trump. Everything's working against Donald Trump at this point. He's not going to do well. And I would love to see Texas and Florida flip. He will freak the fuck out. He will not like that. And he will not like the prospect of him not having a chance to win and uh, being beat in a landslide. I still think that that's a distinct possibility. Still got this fucking cold. I'm doing the best I can, man. I got a cold. I take some pills. It makes me sleepy. I feel better for a bit. Then I start talking and it gets rough again. So we'll just push through this. All right. The next one says Hi, Mike. Been listening for the last month or so and have appreciated hearing views in general agreement with my own. I'm so triggered by Trump's Arlington Cemetery and the medal's disrespect that my co composure is slipping. How can any military person, family, even consider voting for this disassembling fascist autocrat? And don't get me started on the new digital card scam. Max purses, just under 10000 k Transaction limit the triggers of federal report to the bank. Laundering of bribes. Andrew. Yeah, he's kind of a despicable motherfucker. He's tacky. He's white trash. If you hear that thing he did, he he uh, reposted a meme, <laughs> and it's it's not funny. It's kind of disgusting, and I can't believe a former president of the United States would repost this meme. And it was basically suggesting I have to paraphrase because I don't remember exactly what it said, but what. Essentially, the message was is um, Kamala Harris and Hillary Clinton. It's amazing how a blowjob affected these women in different ways. Yeah, fucking hilarious. The thing that's the news, though, is that here's a guy that's running for president, that's a former president, that puts something like that out, certainly um, sexist. And it's got to irritate the shit of all women. All women, not just Democratic women. But he doesn't care. Fucking has no clue. This guy is going to sink himself. And he's going to do it in an amazingly distinctive way. 
He's going to shoot himself in the foot so many times the motherfucker won't be able to walk and we will have some kind of landslide come November. All right, the next one says, Hi, Mike. Kamala Harris is in GA, Georgia, terrifying Republicans into cheating. What is your schedule like? Because Ken Paxton just raided homes of Hispanic abuelitas uh, because they're helping neighbors vote. I am terribly vexed. Anyways, what is a good time to speak on the issues more? Um, later, Will. Well, Will, we can do it any time. Um, I've got um, tomorrow or today I'm recording with, with uh, Ed. And that will run Saturday. Later that night, I'm recording with Arlene. And that will run on Sunday. So um, Sunday night. Think about it. We'll talk then. All right. Hi, Boomer. On the Midas Touch, they've recommended against all enemies. It's available on YouTube. I watched it today on Prime Video. Have you seen it? I have not seen it. After watching against all enemies, I want us to hold all of our electeds accountable and change our laws. As it stands now, we can call a, foreign, a foreigner a terrorist, but not the likes of Timothy McVeigh. How in the hell can that be, Boomer? Honestly, I can't wait until November. I'm so weary with these fucking politics, liars, and power-hungry assholes. Thanks for letting me bent, vent. Beth in, in Indiana. Yeah, I know what you mean. They're, uh, we can call terrorist foreigners terrorist, but there's been some bills to try to acknowledge domestic terrorists. And there are some technicalities there that don't allow us to do that. You're absolutely right. How was that possible? Well, because we've got a fucked Congress and fucked politicians. I'm talking mostly about Republicans, but Democrats have some issues too. And that's why I say once we get this dumpster fire put out, we still got a lot of work to do. We got to make sure the Democrats are straight and that they continue to do what they're supposed to do in serving us. It's about time. I've always said this isn't a war against uh, Democrats versus Republicans. It's about those fucking politicians and us. For decades, they've lined their own pockets, got lazy, and didn't do the things they needed for us, a la codifying Roe v. Wade when they had the chance. And that shit's got to stop. All this information... <laughs> is available and in the ether now. So we know what's going on and we got to take that information and use it to our advantage by pushing these motherfuckers to do the job they're supposed to do. Kick out the Republicans, push the Democrats to do the jobs that they haven't done for decades. All right. The next one. Hi, Boomer. Thank you for the thorough, thoughtful and interesting answer to my question positive male role models in your life. Your grandfathers both sound awesome. Best garage door Jeff. Yeah, they are. They were awesome. And uh, I'm proud of them. And I'm lucky to have had them in my life. My father, who I've talked about many times, was a narcissistic, sociopathic, pathological liar. He was not a good guy. I mean, there were moments when he was fine, but mostly not a good guy. <laughs> Without my grandfathers, I wouldn't have had a good role model, male role model. So I'm very grateful for both of them uh, to have been part of my life for a long time. I was an adult when they both died, so I had them my whole youth, and that was extremely valuable and helpful to me and uh, responsible or me being anywhere close to fucking normal. Jeff, of course, has a PS. He said, my principal in elementary school had one arm. His missing one was shot off in WW2 as he hung tangled in ropes from the side of a battleship. How tough were the men and women from that generation? Yeah. Yeah. How tough were they? They call them the greatest generation. And I think that's, uh, a good title for them. My grandfather, Grandpa Ed, 
was in World War II. My other grandfather was not in World War II. He was working in some capacity in this country for the war effort. A lot of people did that. My grandfather was in World War II, as I've said, and he was in that uh, group called the Red Ball Express. It was kind of an interesting group. It was a job that mostly was handled by black men. But my grandfather was a poor white guy. So I'm sure that may be how he did it. And, you know, the fact is maybe, maybe he volunteered for it. It's kind of a crazy job taking supplies down to the front and taking prisoners back from the front uh, to encampments or whatever. He told me a story. I'm going to tell you the story. I've told it before, but I'm going to tell you again. I said that my grandfather always, every time I saw him, he talked about World War II, but none of the stories were bloody or gory or horrible. They were funny or interesting. I told you the story about the alcohol in in uh, Anzio. He, he told me one time that he was going to um, drop off some supplies to the front, and he picked up this uh, German officer who was a prisoner of war. Now, this prisoner of war had this different kind of metal. It ended up being a uh, an iron cross tripled. So it was pretty unusual, this this metal. So my grandfather is getting this guy loaded out of the truck. And and, the, and and as I told you, my grandfather, when he was young, he was kind of roguish. Not a bad guy, just got into some shit now and again. <laughs> Break a lot. Anyway, he says to this guy, he points at the, the metal and, and he says, give it to me. And the guy goes, no, no, I'm not giving it to you. This is important to me. He says, no, give it to me. He goes, I'm not giving it to you. So my grandfather pulls his pistol, points it at him, and says, give it to me. So the German show, and, and if you're going to feel sorry for this guy, remember, he's a fucking Nazi. So he gets the medal, puts it in his pocket, and uh, they're driving back, and he's back in the back, and there's a screen between him and my grandfather. And this German soldier, speaking English, walks up and says, where do you live? He says, what the fuck kind of question is that? I live in Minnesota. Why do you want to know? He says, well, I, I have some relatives in Hopkins, which is a suburb suburb of Minneapolis. He says, yeah, big fucking deal. Um, he says, when the war is over, I'm going to come and get that back from you. My grandfather says, what are you fucking threatening me here? Fuck you. And uh, he goes, no, 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 no. I want to come and meet you and pay you to get that back. That's how much he wanted it back. And so my grandfather said, yeah, whatever. Dropped him off. And we don't know what happened to the guy. The guy never came to get the medal, clearly, because I saw the medal. He had a bunch of memorabilia from World War II. It was very interesting. But <laughs> those are the kind of stories he told me. He didn't tell me about shooting anybody or getting in a firefight or anything like that. It was all kind of anecdotal and it was all kinds of interesting or funny stories, but it said a lot to me that every time I talked to him, he brought up the big one, world war two. Now don't know what happened to that German, uh, um, officer. Don't fucking care. Cause as I said, he's a fucking Nazi. All right, the next one says, hey, Boomer, love the podcast. Listen while working, and the show leaves me feeling optimistic. J.D., just dumb, Vance, said Trump wouldn't sign national abortion ban, and most people like myself don't believe him. Oh, wonder why. I don't believe him either. Why doesn't he prove it? Florida has an initiative of a six-week abortion ban on the ballot. How about he just show how he voted on that? If he voted yes, then in my opinion, he will sign that national abortion ban. If elected, which thankfully looking less likely. Your thoughts? I think J.D. Vance and Donald Trump will say whatever it takes to get elected, or at least in their mind, to get elected. Uh, if you believe Donald Trump, keep in mind he's a pathological liar. He's lied over and over and over again. So whatever he says really doesn't matter. He's a fucking liar. So um, 
I honestly don't think Donald Trump has a real opinion on the abortion thing. I think when he first started to try to get the abortion uh, um, laws overturned, he did it only for the fact that the evangelicals and the radical right said this was the good thing to do. This will get you reelected. This will help you in fundraising and that sort of thing. That's really all he cares about. Don't think that Donald Trump has any deep set feelings about anything he's talking about. He does not. He will say one thing and then he'll flip going the other way if it doesn't turn out right. Case in point, Project 2025. You know he was on board there because the Heritage Foundation said, Donnie, you're a great guy. We're going to support you all the way. Here's your, um, here's your uh, plan when you get in office. Oh, cool. I'll take that because he's going to get the help. The moment, the moment he starts to get some pushback on Project 2025, what's he say? I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about it. I don't like it. It's crazy. No, I don't like it. You can't take what Donald Trump says as truth ever. And I think the real danger with Donald Trump isn't Donald Trump's plans. He has no fucking plans. The danger of Donald Trump is he's complicit. He's a puppet for even more evil Republicans. They know how to play him. They know how to talk to him. And they will do whatever they have to do to get him to do their bidding. That's the problem. He's like fucking silly putty to the radical Republicans. He'll say and do whatever he has to say to stay in power and get accolades. All right. Interestingly enough, my, my wife and I were were uh, bummed out because we got back from Savannah maybe a week ago and VP Kamala Harris and Tim Walls, or at least VP Kamala Harris, was in Savannah yesterday. I would have loved to have seen her down there. I would have actually gone out and seen her. But we missed it by a week or two. Um, she uh, uh, was defending, uh, shifting away from some uh, more liberal positions she did an interview, as we said earlier, an interview with Tim Walls. And, of course, one of the things they ask her is, why have you shifted your decisions that you've made? And um, But she insisted her values have not changed, even as she's seeking consensus. She was sitting with Governor Tim Walls. Harris was asked specifically about her reversals on banning fracking and decriminalizing illegal border crossings, positions she took during her last run for president. She confirmed she does not want to ban fracking, an energy extraction process key to the economy of the swing state of Pennsylvania. <laughs> and, and she said there should be consequence for people who cross the border without position. I think the most important and most significant aspect of my policy perspective and decisions is my values have not changed, Harris said. She went on to say, I believe it is important to build consensus. It is important to find a common place of understanding where we can actually solve the problem. The interview with CNN's Dana Bash came as voters are still trying to learn more about Democratic ticket in an unusually compressed time frame. President Joe Biden, of course, ended his reelection campaign. About five weeks ago. Now, this interview focused largely on policy as Harris sought to show that she had adopted more moderate positions on issues uh, that Republicans argue are extreme, while Walls defended past misstatements about his biography. Harris hadn't done an in depth interview since she became the party's standard bearer five weeks ago, though she did sit for several while she was still Biden's running mate. She said serving with Biden was one of the greatest honors of my career, and she recounted the moment he called to tell her he was stepping down and would support her. He told me what he had decided to do, and I asked him, are you sure? And he said yes, and that's how I learned about it. She said she didn't ask Biden to endorse her because he was very clear that he was going to endorse me. Harris defended the administration's record on the southern border and immigration, noting that she was tasked with trying to address the root causes 
in other countries that were driving the border crossings. We have laws that have to be followed and enforced. The address that address and deal with the people who cross the border illegally, and there should be consequences. She was asked about Israel's war in Gaza after Hamas's October 7th attack. She said, I'm unequivocally and unwavering in my comment or commitment to Israel's defense and its ability to defend itself. But the vice president also reiterated what she said for months, that civilian deaths are too high amid the Israeli offensive. You couldn't really nail her down there, and that's probably the best thing. She has to say that we're completely committed to Israel because we are an ally of Israel. But she also can't sanction the killing of collateral damage of innocent people. That's a tough fence to straddle, but she has to do it in order to um, get through this election. Now, what she will do after the election, assuming the war is still going on, remains to be seen. There's not a lot an American president can do, and that's why I always thought it was weird that they got the blame for this. Joe Biden didn't start this war. We have an ally in Israel, and we've got to support Israel. But at the same time, Israel has a leader who is basically a mini Donald Trump. He's a fucking war criminal. It's a tough situation, to say the least. She also brushed off Republican Donald Trump's questioning of her racial identity after he suggested falsely that she changed how she presents herself for political reasons. And then she happened to turn black. Harris, who is of black and South Asian heritage, said Trump's suggestion was the same old tired playbook. <laughs> and then Dana Bash says, that it? That's it. She made the right move. Make a quick, quick statement and don't get sucked into a shit throwing contest because that's what Dana Bash was trying to do. And that's what Donald Trump is trying to do, too. He's trying to pull her in. But Kamala Harris and the Democrats know the last thing you want to do is let Republicans get you into a an argument, a fight like that, because that's that's their happy place. That's where they want it to be. So if you don't give them that, they are uncomfortable. And that's what we need to do. Keep those motherfuckers uncomfortable. All right. We'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. So we heard about this horrible display by Donald Trump and the Trump staff. Donald Trump has been going after Joe Biden and Kamala Harris for their alleged disrespect of veterans and fallen soldiers. Donald Trump continues to want to pin 13 um, military deaths when they extracted folks from Afghanistan. What Donald Trump fails to suggest is that since uh, George W. Bush put us in that war uh, up until the time when um, Joe Biden pulled us out of Afghanistan, there were 2,500 people plus that were killed, American soldiers killed in Afghanistan. And during the Trump era, the Trump uh, administration, there were 156 military fighters killed in Afghanistan. But still, they want to pin those 13 on Joe Biden. Now, here's the thing. He's got to find a way to frame that and make him look good. So he attempted that by doing a photo shoot down at Arlington National Cemetery and went to Section 60 where um, soldiers from the Afghanistan war are buried in Arlington Cemetery. This is hallowed ground. This is very hallowed ground. And Arlington Cemetery has strict rules about doing photo shoots and video shoots and that sort of thing uh, at, uh, at Arlington Cemetery. Just out of decency, out of tact, out of whatever. But Donald Trump has none of those things. And uh, he went down there. He was warned not to do it, but he still did it. And then it turned into a fucking Donnybrook of sorts, kind of. Now, after his campaign staffers abruptly pushed aside 
an official at Arlington National Cemetery, and ignored rules prohibiting political activity on its grounds. President Donald Trump is pushing back, believe it or not, saying he was the victim of a smear campaign from bad people out of Washington. He even said this was a fucking setup. Wow. Wow. Talk about projection. Talk about gaslighting. He goes there. He does this. And somehow Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are responsible for this horrible setup. I mean, it gets ridiculous after a while. Every time something goes wrong for Donald Trump, he blames it on somebody else. I mean, when do people finally fucking realize it can't be every the rest of the world every time, Donnie? You can't be the only one that's right all the time. So Donald Trump said those incredible parents asked me to go yesterday to Arlington, and I did. Trump said at a rally Thursday in Michigan, he was actually at the cemetery on Monday. So he's having a little trouble um, remembering shit. And while I was there, I was there for a long time. While we were there, they said, could you take pictures over the grave of my son, my sister, my brother? Would, would you take pictures with us? Yes, uh, sir. I said, absolutely. I did. Then I said, farewell. I said, goodbye. Oh, well, that sounds like a very innocent thing. You know, J.D. Vance went on and was asked about that, and he said, well, it's not like they were producing a commercial there. Funny thing is, within hours after that little visit, there was a commercial with video footage from Arlington National Cemetery. Horrible fucking liars. <laughs> now, NPR first reported details of an altercation between Trump's aides and the unnamed cemetery worker on Monday. Turns out the cemetery worker was a woman. Trump was there to hold a wreath-laying ceremony to mark the third anniversary of an attack on an airport in Kabul that killed 13 American service members amid the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, the 13 that Donald Trump holds Joe Biden responsible for. It was about nothing more than owning the libtards. And Donald Trump disrespected our military and our fallen soldiers so he could look good. Now, Arlington Cemetery, a 639-acre national cemetery in Virginia that holds many American military casualties, has strict restrictions on political campaigning or election-related activities. Officials have reiterated that Trump's team were informed of those rules, notably around an area called Section 60, which is reserved for those recently killed. Now, Donald goes on to say, last night I read that I was using the site to politic, that I used it to politic, Trump said on Thursday night. This all comes out of Washington, just like all these prosecutors come out of Washington. These are bad people we're dealing with. Oh, it's everybody else's fault. You done fucked up and you want to blame somebody else. That's getting tiresome these days, every fucking time. Well, the problem is it's not just Washington that's upset about it. There's a lot of military folks around the country that understand the disrespect and are not happy with you, Donnie. The Army said Thursday that Arlington official pushed by the Trump campaign staffers would not press charges and the cemetery officials considered the matter closed. This employee acted with professionalism and avoided further disruption, the Army said in a statement. This incident was unfortunate, and it is also unfortunate that the ANC employee and her professionalism was has been fairly unfairly attacked. Yeah, of course, she's getting threats, as anybody who speaks out against Donald Trump does. Trump on Thursday went on to directly blame President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, his Democratic rival for president, for the deaths of the service members killed in Afghanistan, saying the Democrats' actions were far worse than having a picture taken at a tombstone. Isn't it always the way? Yeah, I did something bad, but you did it worse. And by the way, Donnie, I mentioned before there was 156 servicemen and women killed when you were in office. Can we talk about them? Where were you then? How come you're not visiting their graves, you sorry fuck? 
Now, Donald Trump goes on to say Joe Biden killed their children by incompetence. Should have never happened, Trump said. Kamala killed their children just as though they had a gun in their hand by gross incompetence. Is this guy in fourth fucking grade? Is this how uh, an adult human talks? And then they accuse me of having a picture taken at the tombstone with the family because they love the president, he added. They love me and I love them. Well, Donnie, there are rules in the cemetery. You did take a picture. You did film a commercial. So you broke the fucking rules. Just admit you're wrong. Trump has repeatedly faced criticism over remarks he made about the service members. Recently, he told a billionaire GOP donor that the Presidential Medal of Freedom he bestowed on her, the nation's highest civilian honor, was much better than its military equivalent, the Medal of Honor. He also reportedly made comments in 2020 that Americans who died in World War I were suckers and losers. He has refuted those claims, although a former top aide has since attested to them. Donald Trump never does anything wrong. All these accusations are lies. Donald Trump never does anything wrong. Well, the fact of the matter is we know he does things wrong because there's evidence of many of these fucking things. When do people who support Donald Trump finally click in their heads that this guy is a buffoon? This guy is a pathological liar. That the things he says are just not fucking possible. The rest of the world is wrong, and Donnie's always right. That's impressive coming out of the mouths of a dumb fucker. All right. Next month's debate between Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump won't have an audience, much like the one earlier. Uh, live microphones when candidates aren't speaking or written notes according to the rules that ABC, the host network, shared this week with both campaigns. So the rules are going to be the same as what happened in CNN. There won't be a live audience. They won't be able to bring notes. And mics will be muted when their opponent is talking. Now, Kamala Harris was cool with leaving the mics open because she knew Donald Trump would fuck himself over, as he always does. But I'm sure she doesn't really care either way. It doesn't matter what the rules are or the venue or what network it's on. Donald Trump doesn't have a prayer. He's going to get fucking annihilated, and uh, it's going to be embarrassing for him. I still think there's a possibility he backs out at the last minute, but he's in a tough spot. He either goes, gets annihilated, or he backs out, and everybody thinks he's a pussy-ass bitch. I think the pussy-ass bitch thing is more of a uh, a problem for Donald Trump. He probably is delusional enough to think that he can handle Kamala Harris. Well, he's going to fuck around and find out. Now, a copy of the rules was provided to the Associated Press on Thursday by a senior Trump campaign official on condition of anonymity ahead of the network's announcement. The Harris campaign on Thursday insisted it was still discussing the muting of mics with ABC. The parameters now in place for September 10th debate are essentially the same as they were for the June debate, the infamous debate between Trump and Joe Biden. Um, it is the only debate that's been firmly scheduled and could be the only time voters see Harris and Trump go head to head before the November general election. I think it will be the only one. Kamala Harris will destroy Donald Trump, and Donald Trump will want no part of any other future debates. Unless he's stupid. <laughs> Unless he thinks he can redeem himself. And he's a dumb enough motherfucker to, to think that. So we'll see. The back and forth over the debate rules reached a fever pitch this week, particularly on the issue of whether the microphones would be muted. <laughs> I apologize for the coughing, but what am I going to do? Now, Harris's campaign had uh, advocated for live microphones for the whole debate, saying in a statement, that the practice would fully allow substantive exchanges between the candidates. Now, you might remember that the Biden campaign had made the microphone muting condition of his decision to accept any debates this year, a decision some aides now regret. 
and I think they were trying to avoid um, Joe Biden from getting steamrolled just by virtue of his personality and his demeanor. Uh, he's much more deliberate and uh, much quieter. And Donald Trump was going to have an easy time of interrupting him constantly. So they wanted to stop that. So that's why they had the muting of the mics. Now that we have Kamala Harris, it's a whole different story. And since Donald Trump is going out of his way to sink his own ship, they decided, well, fuck it, let's let him. So I suspect they will stick with the rules that they started with because I don't think Donald Trump's team will ever agree to having the microphones unmuted. That would be a dumb move for Donald Trump. That's just more time for him to embarrass himself. I mean, he's going to do it anyway, but why give him a whole 90 minutes to do it? It's interesting that Trump's handlers keep insisting on muting him, despite the candidate himself. Donald Trump has said himself, yeah, leave him on. I don't care. Why won't they just do what the candidate wants? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Why Why wouldn't they indeed? Um, because they know better. They know what's going to happen if they let Donald Trump off the chain and do whatever he wants. I mean, he's going to do it anyway, but at least half the time his mic will be muted. So hopefully that will save him some embarrassment. Donald Trump doesn't believe that. Donald Trump believes he's a fucking genius and he'll be able to pull this out of the fire with no problem. The people around him know Donald Trump and they know better. Representatives for Trump who initially scoffed at the subs uh, substitution of Harris into a debate arrangement he initially made with Biden in the race had claimed that Harris sought a seated debate with notes and opening statement specifications her campaign denied. Again, more gaslighting. According to ABC News, the candidates will stand behind lecterns, will not make opening statements, and will not be allowed to bring notes during the 90-minute debate. David Muir and Lindsey Davis will moderate the event at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. And frankly, I don't know how they will do. Do we expect any pushback or fact-checking? Probably not, because that's just not what we find in our journalistic uh, endeavors these days. However, Kamala will be in a position, because she's a good talker, to push back on Donald Trump, and you can expect that she will. She understands what's going to work against Donald Trump. And the thing she needs to do is call him out at every turn. Embarrass him. Because when you embarrass him, that's when he goes crazy. And that's when he acts stupid. So she should want to try to keep triggering him, pointing out his failings, his losses, his crimes. Keep doing that. Keep him on his heels and keep him going crazy. All right, Senator JD or Senator yeah, Senator JD Vance did not exactly receive a warm reception when he spoke on Thursday before the International Association of Firefighters. It's interesting because Tim Walls did get a good response. Vance, who talked to the group at its Boston conference one day after Minnesota Governor Tim Walls did the same took to the podium to try to pitch himself and former President Donald Trump uh, as Republicans who were a different mold compared to past GOP administrations, saying that they were good for unions. Like when Donald Trump told Elon Musk, it was so funny when those people wanted to strike and you just fired them. That doesn't sound like a strong union guy. And uh, J.D. Vance had a tough time selling it. I saw some partial videos of it, and he was getting booed a lot. There was not much excitement about J.D. Vance being there. However, the day before when uh, Tim Walls was there, motherfucker got a standing ovation. So we can kind of see how these people feel about him. After being introduced by Representative Carlos uh, Jimenez, uh, Vance took to the podium and thanked the audience only to be greeted by boos. <laughs> The Semper Fi guys, sounds like we've got some fans and we've got some haters. That's okay. Listen to what I have to say here, and I'll make my pitch. Yeah, not a good start. Later in his speech, Vance touted the blue-collar bona fides of both himself and former President Donald Trump. 
blue collar bona fides. When has Donald Trump ever been a blue collar guy? J.D. Vance, he went to fucking Ivy League schools. He's been a tech bro for years. He wrote a hit book and a hit movie. Yeah, he's just like us. President Trump and I are proud to be the most pro-worker Republican ticket in history. And I want to talk about why we are fighting for working people, why we are going to fight for unions and non-union alike. At this point, Vance was again hit with a cascade of booze. No one's buying the bullshit, J.D. You don't just get to say shit and expect people to believe you when they know of your actions. This is what they try to do. This is what they've um, lowered themselves to, flat-out lying, trying to hoodwink and gaslight people. And at this, at this stage of the game, it ain't working. He, he honestly said this. President Trump and I are the most pro-worker Republican ticket in history. Notice the caveat there, the most pro-worker Republican. Well, that's not not saying much because Republicans don't typically side with unions. And frankly, I don't think Donald Trump and Vance do at all. Um, it, was, it was pretty embarrassing for the guy. I don't know how he got through it. Um, but uh, it, it was kind of funny to watch. You know, it's got to be tough for J.D. Vance knowing um, knowing that uh, um, nobody likes him. I mean, nobody likes him, and everybody loves Tim Walls. Now, J.D. Vance thought he was going to get on this little fucking Trump train and— uh, win the vice presidency and have Donald Trump keel over in the middle of the term and become president of the United States. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Um, wouldn't that be wonderful? Tech bros would love that. But with J.D. Vance and Robert F. Kennedy and Donald Trump himself, their chances of winning are so slim, it's really ridiculous. Now, um, we are going to continue to watch this situation. People people keep saying, oh, it's just the honeymoon period. Uh, it's a sugar high. It's not. It's too big. It's too powerful. This thing isn't going to end. The convention is over. The debate is coming up. And uh, it's going to continue to go the way we're seeing it. This is not going to let up. This snowball running down the hill is just going to get bigger and bigger. And ultimately, it will run over Donald Trump, J.D. Vance, and all the rest of the MAGA fucks. I think we're really at a turning point when uh, we're going to be able to finally put MAGA and Donald Trump behind us. They will have lost for the final time in a big way, and nobody's want to, going to want to be connected to them after it's all said and done. I'm just saying. It's a prediction. I, 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 I agree. But if you look at the facts, you look at the fact that Donald Trump is the worst presidential candidate in history. It only makes sense. I can't wait till this is all over on November 5th or some point thereafter. I want to be able to sit on TikTok in this podcast and say, please explain to me how all these big time presenters on these big time networks kept telling us over and over again that this is going to be a close way race. This is going to be down to the wire. And then when it's not, when it's a landslide or something similar to that, I'm going to wonder why some old white guy in Minnesota in his fucking living room knew what was going to happen. And they didn't, well, they know what's going to happen. They just don't want to talk about it because there's no money in it for them. All right, former President Trump on Thursday asked a federal court to intervene in his hush money case as he seeks to overturn his conviction and further push back his sentencing slated for next month. He's not having much luck. In a filing late Thursday, Trump's attorneys requested the U.S. District Court in Manhattan take over the criminal hush money case, arguing the state's prosecution went against its constitutional rights and contradicted the Supreme Court's ruling on presidential immunity. You know what happened. 
the immunity thing kind of gummed up the first indictment. So they're superseding indictments. Donald Trump and his team go, holy fuck, we weren't expecting that. Only because they don't look past the end of their fucking nose. And now they don't know what to do. They're trying to fight back against this. But time is running out. Judge Juan Marchand isn't fucking around. He said, I don't care about the election. The sentencing will happen when the sentencing happens. So I expect on September 18th, we will see the sentencing. But, you know, as I've said before, even if none of these trials or the sentencing comes till after the election, I'm, I'm okay with that. The 34 convictions has done enough damage to hurt Donald Trump, incapacitate Donald Trump. And when the election is over and he's not president, he's not a presidential candidate, he is going to get absolutely crucified because he will have no more protection. Now, of course, we know uh, Trump was convicted of 34 felony counts, falsifying business records, becoming the first former U.S. president to become a convicted felon. Charges stem from reimbursements made to Trump's one-time fixer and attorney, Michael Cohen, for a hush money payment. And then, of course, we come up with this immunity thing. But here's the deal. This immunity thing really doesn't impact this case. This immunity thing is about official acts while you're president. All this other shit happened before he was president. So the crime was committed prior to being a president when he did not have any fucking immunity. The only reason he brought this up is because there were some bits of evidence that may have happened after he was president, after the crime was committed. Um, and so he was trying to use that. Well, they, they can't use that because I was president and I have total immunity. Well, you don't have total immunity. But what Jack Smith did is he cut out, he carved this thing out so they couldn't do that anymore. And this is why they're freaking out because Jack Smith fucking played them again. And now they have to hustle around and try to get this delayed again. Um, in spite of the fact they've already delayed it once. So Jack Smith in the January 6th case, that he's upset about that because now he's got to get back from the get-go to try to get that put aside and, and delayed. And the sentencing, he's trying to get delayed in the, um, um, the Manhattan District case. He's juggling a lot of balls, and he's got an election coming up in two months. All of this is going to work badly against Donald Trump. He's he's going to have a hell of a time with this. And this is what I've told you before. Um, he's got too many balls in the air. If he was a 35-year-old 35 per, 35 perfectly healthy man, that would crush that man. Donald Trump is getting to the point where he can't control everything. And because he's a control freak, it's freaking him out. It's becoming overwhelming. And this is what I've always said. It's going to become overwhelming. He's not healthy mentally or physically, and it's taking its toll. We can see it. Um, so we'll, we'll see how this continues. Now, Trump's motion to dismiss the indictment is currently pending before Judge Juan Marchand, whom his team has alleged uh, conflict of interest due to his daughter's work with top Democrats. Yeah, he's trying to get it put aside because his daughter has a job someplace. Sorry, Donnie, that's not a fucking thing. Now, the ongoing proceedings will continue to cause direct and irreparable harm to President Trump, the leading candidate um, in the presidential election. Well, dude, that's not the case. You're not the leading candidate. You might be the leading Republican, but uh, Kamala Harris is uh, is uh, kicking your ass, probably more so than you even know. Um, so he's going to keep filing these motions. He's going to keep losing these motions, as he has. And he's going to freak out more and more every time. Now, a federal judge already rejected Trump's first attempt at moving the hush money case to a federal court last summer. You remember when that happened? Oh, let's take it to federal court. That doesn't do anything. He still get convicted, but it will delay it. And this is all about delay for Donald Trump. And this is 
where you almost have to feel sorry for Donald Trump. I'm I'm not feeling sorry for him. But his only hope is that he gets it past the election so when he wins the election, he can shut all this stuff down. But you and I know he doesn't have a fucking prayer at winning this election. So he's just delaying it, delaying the inevitable, and he's going to get crucified when it's all said and done because he'll be far less protected after the election than he is now. But this is what narcissists do. They always try to put something off. They're cowards, so they don't like to address something directly. They don't like to confront something directly. They're better to put it off like it will never happen, or they'll come up with some genius idea to battle back. They never do. It always comes due. The bill always comes due, and they always get their ass kicked. Um, it, it, it. Currently remains unclear how the immunity decision could impact another attempt to move the case, but Jack Smith specifically redid the indictment, a superseding indictment, so that it was a workaround around that whole immunity thing. And from what I've heard, people who have read it just said, did a pretty fucking good job. I mean, Jack Smith isn't going to go through all this shit and not come out with a conviction. Just not going to do it. We got the convictions in the Manhattan district. He's going to get convictions in Washington, D.C. He's going to get convictions in Florida, too. We're still waiting on his appeal to the 11th Circuit regarding um, Aileen Cannon's decision to dismiss the case. That's just absolutely absurd. Of course, it's going to get overturned, and we'll see if Aileen stays on the job or she gets her ass kicked out. I'm not sure how that's all going to work. I know Jack was a little concerned about asking that she be kicked out. That might be a bridge too far, but uh, it may be something that the 11th Circuit, instead of asking to kick her out, just present the evidence and let the 11th Circuit make that decision. I mean, because frankly, she is a fucking embarrassment to the judicial system in Florida. I would think the 11th Circuit, after overturning one of her previous decisions and now having to do it again, will be getting tired of this and tired of the embarrassment. We know that there were judges in the 11th Circuit that told her she should recuse herself, and she ignored them. So if they care about the law, the, the legal system, they will probably suggest to her that you take a walk or take a powder and you're not going to be on this case anymore. At least we can hope that's what's going to happen. All right. We are going to wrap up the Rational Boomer podcast. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. I hope you have a great day and we will talk to you again tomorrow.